Are you ready, kids? Nah, man, I'm really not ready. Are you ready? Of course you're ready. The video's about you. Why did I even ask you? This is a dangerous zone we're entering into together. Do you realize that? I mean, first you're gonna have all these people keep hounding you. Oh, did you look at the video game? Did you look at the new movie? The show got better. Look at this, look at that. And then Viacom's gonna sue the crap out of both of us. They notoriously take down YouTube videos talking about their stuff. Well, I guess we've come this far, huh? When people make content for the general public, there's always a discussion about something called the target audience. The term originates from, guess what, targets, and that the goal is to aim right for the center in order to get that sweet bullseye. What a lot of people forget about targets though, is that there's a lot more to the target itself than just the bullseye. In fact, there's usually several other rings outside of the bullseye, and in some games like darts or axe throwing, there are places on the target that score more points than the bullseye itself. So really, when people talk about a target audience, they're saying that they're aiming for the bullseye, but they won't necessarily be mad if a few metaphorical arrows hit outside of that range. They just don't want to miss entirely. You'll miss. <laughs> Here's an example, this video. The target audience for this video probably isn't a marketing executive at Viacom CBS, which is a contributing factor as to why this video will get copyright claimed and demonetized on YouTube. Yeah! The actual target audience for this video, if I had to define it, would probably be someone who's familiar with the show SpongeBob SquarePants and either wants to know why it's so popular or wants a new way to look at its popularity. That said, just because I'm not directly targeting that marketing executive doesn't mean I wouldn't be thrilled if they watched and commented. They're still on the metaphorical target, just not front and center. So what does this concept have to do with SpongeBob SquarePants? Well, if you fit that description of my theoretical target audience, then you may already know the answer. A huge reason why SpongeBob was so successful was because it not only managed to reach its target audience of elementary and middle school children, it also managed to make an impact on the parents of those very children. The show was written and designed in a way that many of the jokes, storylines, and characters are relatable to both children and adults. And while many might say that this is in and of itself the unique strength of a show like SpongeBob, that's actually far from the case. Most successful kid shows, whether cartoon or otherwise, have always made sure that the parents of those children stay on the target somewhere. Whether it be through the occasional inappropriate joke, the inclusion of relatable adult characters, or in the rarest of cases, an engaging narrative that even the sternest of adults can't ignore. But what's most important to understand about these shows is that ultimately, the children have remained at the center of the target. They're the bullseye. So that begs the question, what do children even like? Unfortunately, the answer to that question is way harder than some might think it is, because the people who have to answer that question aren't the children themselves, but adults who think they know what kids like, based on their former experience as kids and their potentially current experience as parents. But thankfully for those adults, market research exists, and as such, companies have been able to develop strategies that tend to do a great job at appealing to children. In fact, many parents are concerned that they've gotten a bit too good, which is a part of why children's programming, and especially children's advertising is subject to government regulation. The biggest of these strategies is the most obvious. Feature kids in your kids' content. The theory is that people who identify similarly to the characters they watch on screen are enabled to relate more closely to those characters. To no one's surprise, a story about tax fraud isn't exactly something kids can easily relate to. Kids go to school, make friends, play games, do homework, and try and figure out how the world works. So seeing characters deal with those exact problems makes the stories easy for children to emotionally engage with. More important than the children themselves, however, are the imaginative childlike scenarios the characters in these cartoons find themselves in. Often, the main character's life would otherwise be perfectly ordinary if not for the one key twist that adds a supernatural element to the mix. If Timmy Turner's fairy godparents, Lincoln Loud's ten sisters, or Huey, Dewey, and Louie's wealthy capitalist uncle were removed from their respective shows, the stories would suddenly mirror real-life engagements more closely. Even when the main characters aren't children, their exhibition of childlike tendencies and their dealing with childlike scenarios is often the compromise made to ensure that these shows still appeal to their target audience. Even the stories of more fantasy-driven shows like Steven Universe and the Powerpuff Girls ultimately focus on solving problems that are comparable to situations the average Western child would encounter in a stereotypical school or family environment. Many of the supporting characters on these shows fit very similar archetypes. The dim-witted dad, the nerdy friend, the love interest, and so forth. 
even the animation of these shows has become fairly homogenized over time. On top of the standard practices of Western cartoons, from the rounded shapes of friendlier characters to the jagged edges of evil characters to the orientation of body shape directly correlating with the perceived strength of a character, kids' cartoon shows have come to develop their own informal rule set. Main characters are often really short to emphasize their youthful qualities, generally with big heads and emphasized facial features to exaggerate their emotions and feelings. Adults tend to have more homogenized, sometimes boxy looks to convey a perceived mundanity to these characters. They also tend to be larger than other characters, with those homogenized bodies taking up a lot of space in the same way that adults take up space in a kid's world. These are all logical, artistic decisions for a show that follows the directions set by the standard, but it's nonetheless disheartening to see how similar many of these shows actually are. Often, the elements that set these shows apart can ultimately be reduced to a small handful of bullet points, which really takes away from the perceived novelty of these shows. All of this is why the pitch for SpongeBob SquarePants was so weird. Of all of these different rules of thumb for cartoons, SpongeBob broke every single one of them. Yet in spite of that, it still managed to become Nickelodeon's biggest IP, dominate the cartoon world of the early 2000s, and still influence animation to this day. Very. The first and easiest place to see this bucking of trends is with the design of the character himself. It's in the name. SpongeBob's not round, he's square. On paper, his design is both literally and metaphorically full of holes. Main characters should be cute. SpongeBob's weird looking and strangely designed. His teeth are too off-putting for a protagonist. It's more fitting for the comic relief character. His nose is too big and his eyelashes are too distracting. Worst of all, SpongeBob isn't even a kid at all. He's a working adult who wears a button-up shirt and tie. Hope it looks good on you, SpongeBob. <laughs> that last point was the major point of contention at Nickelodeon. How will children relate to SpongeBob if he doesn't live with his parents, doesn't go to school, doesn't get grounded, doesn't experience the same kind of problems that kids normally encounter? In order to get such a concept greenlit, SpongeBob would have to, at the very least, go to boating school every now and again to have some classroom experience. His parents would have to show up in a few episodes as well. These were things that show creator Steven Hellenberg didn't necessarily want, but was willing to compromise for. Just like how I am slightly modifying the original audio and visuals from the show, as a meager attempt at avoiding YouTube's content ID matching system. Very. Thankfully, these minor concessions only affected a few episodes, some of which ended up being some of the best in the show's early run. More importantly, the show would still be able to focus on the escapades of a character that, according to best practice, no child should ever be able to relate to. The pilot episode is something that simply shouldn't work in a kid's show for that exact reason. Instead of featuring the classroom or the home or the playground, it features SpongeBob applying for and eventually receiving a job. It's a subject matter that kids can't directly relate to, but it works because in its short runtime, the episode still manages to get us to care about SpongeBob and root for him to get the job and feed all those pesky anchovies. That's the power of good character development. SpongeBob certainly did act childish at times, but he was far from an actual child in terms of behavior, and it's that characteristic that defines SpongeBob as a character and contrasts him from the rest of the cast. But that cast was far more than mere window dressing themselves. They all also bucked the trends of cartoon stereotypes of old, and brought a multi-layered complexity to the show that made it stand out. The most obvious instance of bucking trends outside of SpongeBob himself is with the only major villain of the show, Plankton, who was first introduced by being stepped on. You blasted barnacle head! I mean, hi. Instead of appearing large, gruff, and intimidating, Plankton, being a Plankton, was characterized as being so small that, in early episodes, other characters needed to pull out a magnifying glass to even see him. What completes the character, though, is Mr. Lawrence's voice for him. Your secret formula is finally mine! This booming, sinister voice contrasts brilliantly with Plankton's tiny, bean-shaped nugget of a design, bringing a whole other dimension to the character. He's not just tiny, he's tiny with a big brain and a big ego. Taking this sort of character and placing him in the same environment as SpongeBob leads to the kind of interactions that simply wouldn't be possible with typical cartoon archetypes. Many kids' cartoon shows depict a classical good versus evil narrative, but interactions with Plankton are almost always more nuanced. All that it would have taken to get rid of Plankton would have been a simple twist of the foot, but SpongeBob peeled him off of his shoe instead, showing him the same kind of compassion that he does with anyone else. 
More pertinently, SpongeBob often ignored the clear evil intent behind Plankton's schemes in favor of giving him the benefit of the doubt. Early episodes with Plankton followed a similar storyline of Plankton manipulating SpongeBob's innocence in an attempt to get what he wants, but then ultimately failing when SpongeBob uncovers the plan. At first, this seems like an attempt to throw in a stereotypical cartoon message about growing up and not placing too much trust in someone. Importantly, however, the show didn't frame SpongeBob's perspective as inherently wrong or naive. Instead, it tends to paint this as an admirable trait. Walking Small, for instance, featured Plankton attempting to teach SpongeBob about assertiveness as a means of clearing space for a new chum bucket attraction. When SpongeBob discovered the scheme, the expected move might be for SpongeBob to act assertively towards Plankton, effectively punishing him for his foul deed. But instead, SpongeBob resorted back to what SpongeBob does best, using kindness and selflessness to bring people back to the beach and effectively prove Plankton's ethos incorrect. An earlier attempt at this kind of episode was fun, which ultimately failed to take that final step in favor of painting SpongeBob's boss, Mr. Krabs, as being correct in not trusting Plankton. This is a weaker episode, not just because it shortchanges SpongeBob's character, but because it also shortchanges Mr. Krabs. In the show's best episodes, Krabs tended to be wrong more often than he is right, which is confusing for a show that, at first glance, often frames him as a pseudo-parental figure to SpongeBob. Unlike SpongeBob, who spent years preparing himself for a position as a fry cook, Krabs is a successful cook, entrepreneur, and businessman who owns one of the most popular casual dining locations in all of Bikini Bottom. With that being the case, it would be expected that, in a show like this, Krabs would be a mentor for his employees, teaching them his wisdom so that they may succeed both in and out of the restaurant. But that's not exactly how it pans out. In episodes like Squeaky Boots and Arg, Mr. Krabs' greedy and profit-driven tendencies led him to make a bad decision that would eventually come back to haunt him, quite literally in the latter case. But in Season 2, this concept was taken a step further, when SpongeBob himself began to see Krabs for who he was. Jellyfish Hunter is a great example of that concept, where his own idea for jelly-covered Krabby Patties was stolen by Mr. Krabs and commodified to the point of extreme animal abuse. There's a satisfying payoff that comes from SpongeBob being brought to Mr. Krabs' sadistic factory, and then being motivated to tear the whole thing down and set the jellyfish free. In some sense, this is the exact opposite of SpongeBob's interactions with Plankton. In Bikini Bottom, sometimes the so-called good guys can be the real evil ones. This is true for other adult figures in the show as well. Mrs. Puff, SpongeBob's boating instructor, is pretty quickly revealed to be a pretty bad teacher to SpongeBob in boating school, and she frequently is shown trying to find a way to be able to get him out of her class by any means necessary. It's quite obvious that Mrs. Puff is much more motivated by her own self-interest than any degree of willingness to actually help her students. Sandy, the mysterious land squirrel, breaks convention by exhibiting a number of stereotypically male archetypes, such as an interest in athleticism and a hot temper. While she often is a helpful resource for SpongeBob, these attributes often inhibit her ability to be as helpful as she can be, whether it be in Karate Choppers where her love of the sport goes awry, or in Pre-Hibernation Week where she takes it a step further and forces the entire town to obsessively look for SpongeBob when he merely decides that he needs a break from the extremities. And those townspeople aren't exactly great role models either. Many episodes, from Something Smells to Culture Shock, go out of their way to show just how selfish and judgmental these fish folk can be. But even in the all-too-common moments where SpongeBob is ridiculed by the citizens of Bikini Bottom, he still pushes through the adversity with as much optimism as he can muster. Even Patrick, who comes off as very nicely fitting that village idiot archetype, played a very different role in the world of SpongeBob. Because SpongeBob is a fully functional working adult and Patrick is, well, not, Patrick provided a sort of childish balance to the show, pulling on SpongeBob's more carefree tendencies to often challenge his better judgment. In Hooky, for instance, Patrick encouraged SpongeBob to play with metaphorical fire. He saw something that looked fun without having any real understanding of the consequences. SpongeBob, meanwhile, was a bit more hesitant to jump on a hook and have fun right away, especially after Mr. Krabs' warning. Eventually, Patrick convinces SpongeBob to play on the hooks with him anyway, which eventually led to SpongeBob getting caught. Another example comes from Suds, an episode that quite literally wouldn't have a source of conflict if not for Patrick's childish fear of going to the doctor. Playing off of that childish comparison even further, Patrick has also been known for his temper tantrums since the Valentine's Day episode, where a failure to understand a slight mishap with SpongeBob's present for him drove him mad. A similar experience happened in Life of Crime, where he accused SpongeBob of stealing his candy bar. He may be SpongeBob's best friend, but he's nonetheless a bit of a jerk sometimes. 
Of all of the characters in the show, however, none are quite as important as Squidward in terms of defying the expectations of kids' cartoon shows. In fact, Squidward bucks the trend of kids' cartoons more than any other character on the entire show, primarily because he's not just a side character, he's the deuteragonist, the second protagonist of the show. If SpongeBob were merely just a show about SpongeBob, it would already be a pretty revolutionary program. As mentioned, SpongeBob's not a child. He's an adult who goes through adult life and faces adult problems, and his interaction with other characters plays to a deeper maturity in the show that simply isn't present with other cartoons. On top of this, Patrick's inclusion in the show plays this up further by testing SpongeBob's own independence and maturity. But Squidward pulls both SpongeBob and viewers in a different direction, towards the reality of adulthood that few of us want to really face. And this at first may not make a lot of sense. After all, he's presented as a self-absorbed, pun not intended, arrogant and impatient prick with very few redeemable qualities. Remember, no employee wants to be a Squidward. But what's important to understand about Squidward's characterization in the show is that these things are a product of his situation rather than character traits on their own. Squidward is a cephalopod with a dream. He's an artist as seen by the number of paintings and self-portraits across his house. He's a musician as we can see from his practicing of the clarinet. He's a gardener, a baker, and even a dancer. He has a love of fine art and a desire to not necessarily be famous, but at the very least be recognized for his efforts. There's only one problem. He's not exactly good at any of these things, and instead is stuck at his cashier job at the Krusty Krab in order to make ends meet. When viewing the character through this lens, it's easier to see what Squidward represents, adulthood at its absolute worst. While Squidward on his own isn't a bad guy, his circumstances have chipped away at his better instincts to the point that all that's left is the gloomy face of depression itself. The real reason Squidward acts more as a deuteragonist than as a supporting character in the show is because unlike Plankton or Sandy or even Patrick, SpongeBob and Squidward's circumstances are virtually the exact same. They both live on the same street, work the same job, have the same boss, and make the same money. They both have dreams and aspirations that aren't wholly realized. They both are viewed as outcasts by the society of Bikini Bottom. The only real difference between the two characters, outside of their species, is how they view those circumstances. In this sense, every relation SpongeBob has with the other characters is reframed through the angle of a Squidward. SpongeBob puts so much emotional weight into these relationships, and always does his best to do the right thing. Meanwhile, Squidward's interaction with these characters often amounts to... And that approach reflects his own worldview, this grim, cynical outlook on the world that a depressing adulthood has brought him. And what could be better than serving up smiles? Being dead. For a show about SpongeBob, some of its most memorable and powerful episodes are episodes that star Squidward instead, a trend that starts as early as season one's Reef Blower short and continues on throughout the entire early run of the show. And while many of these episodes follow a very similar basic structure, from bubble stand to idiot box to snowball effect, it's nonetheless impressive how these episodes manage to find new ways to frame the same contrast between the cephalopod and his annoying spongy neighbor. Pizza Delivery, for instance, is about Squidward's lack of pride in his work. After being sent on a delivery with SpongeBob and getting lost, Squidward was quick to abandon the task in favor of finding a way home. But SpongeBob, meanwhile, was determined to bring the pizza to the customer at all costs, overcoming fatigue, heat, a freaking underwater tornado, and even Squidward himself to eventually bring the meal to the customer. But after the customer insultingly rejects the food, Squidward, having seen the integrity of SpongeBob's work, stands up to the customer for the sake of his coworker. The episode could have easily stopped with rejection as a comically cruel punchline, but had it ended that way, it would have proven Squidward's ethos right, the idea that it's not even worth trying because no one will ultimately care. Instead, the extra step is taken to instead say the exact opposite, that SpongeBob's effort deserves to be commended and rewarded. One of the best episodes in this format has to be Squidville, because unlike other episodes in this format, the ultimate decision to change comes entirely from Squidward himself instead of being stimulated by an external force, be it a nasty customer or Spongebob. The episode opened with Spongebob and Patrick playing with reef blowers and destroying Squidward's house in the process. This led to Squidward leaving for a town filled with people just like him, who find joy in peacefulness, art, music, and canned bread. 
It made him extremely happy at first until the repetition started to drain him. He realized that Spongebob and Patrick weren't the ones making him miserable after all, but instead, his perspective. Seeing the same kind of reef blower that started the episode, Squidward started playing with it and annoying his neighbors such that, by the end of the episode, Spongebob and Patrick failed to recognize him because of how happy he sounds. Well, we know one thing, it sure isn't that guy! And while that fleeting happiness may be good for Squidward, it's certainly not representative of the true inner happiness that audiences like to see in their characters, which is perhaps why many cite Band Geeks as the best episode of the entire series. Swilliam, similar to the people of Tentacle Acres, acts a lot like Squidward in terms of his love of the arts and his arrogance, but differs in one key way. He succeeded in every way Squidward didn't. With this new enemy, suddenly the people of Bikini Bottom, the people that Squidward constantly claims to be the cause of his misery, were his allies. Having made empty promises out of desperation to his rival, Squidward was forced to place trust in people that he rarely trusted before, if at all. And while they took an extremely roundabout way to get there, they ultimately were able to successfully play the bubble bowl and exceed all expectations. Swilliam's shock represents the metaphorical death of the insecurities that held Squidward back. And the final shot of the episode is one of few moments where Squidward is wholly unilaterally happy. Years later, fans still cite this moment as a highlight of not just the show, but the early 2000s. When Hillenburg's show made it to the Super Bowl in an admittedly underwhelming way, it was Squidward, not Spongebob, that made the appearance. While Spongebob may be the figurehead and mascot of the show he's from, it's Squidward that many care about the most. And to many, that's extremely surprising. Not just because he's such an important character to a show called Spongebob Squarepants, but also because he's the most adult character in a show that airs on a kid's network. SpongeBob SquarePants would go on to not only become the most successful Nicktoon, not only one of the most successful children's cartoons, but one of the most successful animated properties, period. Instead of being compared to Dexter or Jimmy Neutron, SpongeBob is often compared to Bugs Bunny and Mickey Mouse. And for good reason, because it's obvious that this show managed to capture a substantially wider audience than Nickelodeon's typical demographic. How did Hillenburg and his team accomplish such an incredible feat? How did a show that subverts most preconceived expectations for what a kid's show looks like manage to outperform the whole lot? Quite simply, they did it by not even trying to make a kid's show. Hillenburg's target audience wasn't children at all. If anything, it was the adults. It would be foolish to talk about SpongeBob SquarePants without mentioning another Nicktoon, Rocco's Modern Life. This, like SpongeBob, was a show massively ahead of its time in the fact that it deliberately didn't target kids, covering mature topics and complex sociopolitical issues in its stories. Also like SpongeBob, the show stars an anthropomorphic animal, in this case, Rocco the Wallaby, as he navigates a modern adult lower class life with his friends and neighbors. And also like SpongeBob, the relationship between Rocco and his friends tended to subvert typical expectations for kids shows and led to more dynamic and fleshed out concepts. Unfortunately, this was a show that audiences of the 1990s simply weren't ready for yet. The idea of a show airing on a kids network that touched on topics like infidelity, sexuality, corporate greed, and in one of its more well-known episodes, problems within the cartoon industry itself, I am the cheese! I am the best character on the show! was beyond unacceptable to not just parent of the era, but Nickelodeon as a brand. In that sense, it was impressive that the show had as long of a run as it did. While the show was created by Joe Murray, who would go on to make Camp Laszlo on Cartoon Network, its creative director was none other than Steven Hillenburg, who was given full control over the show for its fourth and final season. After the show was canceled, many of the Rocco staff would go on to work on what became SpongeBob SquarePants, having learned from their experience working on Rocco. The result is a cartoon that aims to do the same thing as Rocco, but with a slightly more sanitized feel and a bit more polish. Perhaps it was this sanitation that helped SpongeBob succeed in a way that Rocco didn't, or perhaps it was necessary for Rocco to exist, along with a few other notable programs, so that parents would become comfortable with the idea of kids watching programs with more adult themes. After all, if these shows argue anything, it's that the entire concept of children's programming is a bit of a farce. In reality, children are nothing more than little adults with a few years less experience. Children are adults in the making. Children are the future. And it's clear from Hillenburg's work that he truly believed that. Target audiences be damned. Or, um, excuse me, darned. Gary! 
This is no more apparent than in what may be Hillenburg's magnum opus as a cartoonist and a creative. For the big screen, the narrative took what was once implicitly hinted at in the show and made it explicit. Before, SpongeBob was ignored or not trusted by his peers for a variety of different reasons, but in the movie, he was outright told that the reason why he can't get what he wants is because he's a kid. And kids, according to the likes of Mr. Krabs and Squidward and King Neptune, aren't capable of overcoming the true harshness that comes with adulthood, as represented by a brave quest to recover the king's crown. Throughout the rest of the film, all of these people were, one at a time, proven to be wrong. His plankton managed to outsmart all of them, from taking the crown, to stealing the Krabby Patty formula, to brainwashing the entire town and the king himself. Daddy, yes! Even Squidward, the figurehead of miserable adulthood itself, wasn't able to stop plankton after figuring out the plan a few days too late. This left the fate of the entire town to the two kids, who faced encounter after encounter with gruff adult male stereotypes, from the patrons of the Thug Tug, to Dennis the Biker Hitman, to the Deep Sea Diver Cyclops, only to overcome these obstacles by being true to themselves. Often, SpongeBob and Patrick didn't even have to do anything for the seemingly gruff and scary demeanor of these so-called tough guys to break down on itself. In the Thug Tug, for instance, the gang leader assumed that SpongeBob and Patrick were the only bubble-blowing babies at the bar, but right before breaking them, it was two other attendees that ended up breaking into song. At the trench, SpongeBob and Patrick may have thought they had made it by being so-called men, but it was actually the song and dance that revealed the monster's inner kind hearts. In the emotional climax of the movie, when SpongeBob and Patrick were captured by the Cyclops and baking under a heat lamp, it wasn't any perception of toughness that saved them. Instead, it was a pair of tears, a symbol of immaturity itself, that ultimately rescued them from their doom. It's important to note that, like the show, SpongeBob rarely actually acted like a kid in the way that his peers described. In fact, many of his actions in the film mirrored the kinds of things that adults would do in the same situation. Most notably, in one of the more memorable parts of the film, after getting denied his promotion at the start of the movie, SpongeBob turned to a substance. It just so happened that his vice was ice cream. The only difference between SpongeBob and everyone else was his optimism, naivety, and innocence. Traits that aren't inherently immature on their own, but are branded with immaturity by those around him. So after being saved by their own tears, SpongeBob and Patrick left Shell City with a renewed sense of confidence and self-assurance. The final confrontation with Dennis proved how fragile and insecure perceived maturity and manliness actually can be, with blind rage leading to Dennis's ultimate demise. And upon returning to the recently rebranded Planktopolis, SpongeBob chose to accept the label that Plankton and everyone else placed on him and embrace it, effectively reclaiming the term through the power of a twisted sister parody. I'm a goofy goober! The song itself serves as the perfect capstone to the SpongeBob ethos. The idea that kids are adults and adults can be kids. The idea that we're all people regardless of age or experience. The idea that those that we view as immature and innocent have a lot to teach us. And the idea that what we generally perceive as adulthood perhaps isn't as great or wise as it claims on the tin. The invitation the movie extends is not for the kids, but instead the adults. A reminder that the kid inside is always there and will never go away. Whether it be through SpongeBob's life as an adult and the obstacles he encounters, Squidward's dismal outlook on the world being saved by the joy that comes with immaturity, or any number of tough men being bested by youthful optimism, SpongeBob SquarePants deconstructed the entire narrative of both what kids programming could be and what kids themselves could be. And this ultimately led to an era of cartoons unlike any other, where to this day, children are being continually challenged with mature subject matter, complicated emotional beats, and even serialized storylines, things that were rarely seen in children's Western animation prior. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for SpongeBob itself, which, in the eyes of many, has declined in quality since the release of the first movie. Many cite flanderization, overly detailed animation, and lack of original ideas as the primary driver. But while these things may be symptomatic of the decline of SpongeBob, viewing the show through this lens clearly brings the issue into focus. In later seasons, the target was hung back up, and the show clearly began to reframe its characters through the lens of a child instead of an adult. 
Instead of approaching adult problems with a youthful mindset, SpongeBob often finds himself throwing temper tantrums over minor problems they do this all the time. and getting what he wants through sheer happenstance. Instead of being saved by SpongeBob's childish optimism, Squidward is the victim of unrealistic abuse and mockery for the sake of weak slapstick jokes, unintentionally justifying his own misery. Mr. Krabs now is a moronic, selfish, and despicable character, and Patrick's become an insufferably stupid and unnecessarily cruel husk of his former self. Plankton's fallen into a more standard villain archetype while getting comparatively bigger in size every season, while Sandy's transformed into a nerdy science type with none of the character. Instead of testing SpongeBob's ethos, balancing the cast, and giving a wide array of perspectives on the challenges of adulthood, these characters reverted to more stereotypical character tropes that fit the original mold of children's cartoon show far more closely. With SpongeBob himself as not a complex adult with a childlike approach to life, but quite literally is the very kid that he spent an entire movie proving he wasn't. As of writing, it remains to be seen, but this sanitation appears to be taking an even deadlier stranglehold in these characters in the upcoming prequel series Camp Coral, a show Hillenburg explicitly did not want to be made. After all, the absolute worst thing one could do to a kid's show featuring adult characters facing adult problems would be to turn them into crying children. On the other hand, however, that's arguably what the main show already did. Perhaps it's due to my age, or perhaps it's an inner stubbornness I can't shake, but I have absolutely no interest in revisiting SpongeBob SquarePants in its current form, despite how much of an impact it clearly left on me as a child. I think the reason I and so many others appreciated SpongeBob was because it was the only cartoon that spoke to us in the way we truly wanted to be spoken to. Not as kids, but as youthful adults. It was encouraging to look forward into the future with the same sort of joy that defined Spongebob as a character without the complete immaturity of a Patrick or the cynicism of a Squidward. It's the same kind of energy I try my best to embrace day to day. Having said that, it's a shame that the generations below mine, generations that are set to face even harder trials and tribulations than my own, can't look to Spongebob for that very same thing. It's easy to say that kids like kids things, but it'd also be wrong to say that. Ultimately, kids are just as human as anyone else, and while we all come from different backgrounds and walks of life, that shared human experience in a largely oppressive world is ultimately what unifies us all, regardless of age, gender, race, sexuality, or whatever else. So while targets look good in a boardroom, I prefer the blank wall. When your target is everywhere, a good idea is guaranteed to stick, so long as um, you don't get sued for making it. Barry! There, I did it. Happy now? Satisfied? Anything else I need to say? And no, I'm not reviewing the SpongeBob movie game. Just an innocent young man trying for the Dutchman six years later, and we haven't learned much, man. Comments coming in on the daily comments coming in and it's honestly kind of crazy. Spongebob haters? You know we've got them. Of all the crosses to fucking die on, Bikini Bottoms? It was a good TV show. Damn, who didn't know? For the Spongebob movie game? No joke. It's super lame. Five, six times you play the same fucking level. Point that out to you fucks and I'm the motherfucking devil. What do you want? Lamb and broccoli's on the menu. You don't like what's served? Try another fucking venue. Who lives in a pineapple under the sea? A show I really like, but his fans are kinda crazy. Wish it couldn't be that way. Wish it wasn't so. Review the SpongeBob movie game, the answer's always no! Let's well, say you're starting out online and you want some views. What to make, what to write, so many things to choose. Maybe that cartoon that you loved back in the day. What could go wrong? You hear yourself say. Nothing much, at least for the first little while. Subscribers are going up and hey, that makes you smile. But now it's been a year, or maybe even two, it's kind of getting old, you want to make something new. You take some time to write about a subject that's your passion, five months later you release and now you're out of fashion. Turns out all they wanted is that guy in the square pants. Hey, can you also do the one for the Game Boy Advance? Who lives in a pineapple under the sea? A show I really like, but his fans are kind of crazy. Wish it couldn't be that way, wish it wasn't so. Review the Spongebob movie game, the answer's always... I was never the biggest Spongebob fan. I liked Timmy, Zim, 
Norbert and Dag. You think SpongeBob's the peak of storytelling, mate? Ravioli, ravioli, give me a break. Lamhut had it rough. It's really quite unfair. He's a very clever man, and you know he's a software engineer? You're all trying to meme on him with loop de loop and pull. All he's trying to do is get socio technical. Fans said I sound like Squidward, thought I couldn't go lower. But then I realized these rhymes are just hotter than Krakatoa. What do you sound like? You fucking mouth breather? Poor shit ain't an instrument either. <laughs> Who lives in a pineapple under the sea? A show I really like, but his fans are kinda crazy. Wish it couldn't be that way. Wish it wasn't so. Review the SpongeBob movie game, the answer's always no! If not, it'll not just be something you wish. Then stop leaving comments and take the sponge dick. That was a joke, you may not have got it. But this tape is the show, the first season's on it. These SpongeBob fans are alive. It sucks me more than I thought. This fandom's random twits are like bikini bottoms robots. I wish we could just have a lever. Switch it back to obey. This show is really quite clever, but this shit is not okay. Now it's time to go wrap this up. Loop de loop and pull. You know what line should follow that up? Your shoes are looking cool. This track was for those who were hurt by the sponge. It might have been cringy, but now it's all done. Who lives in a pineapple under the sea? A show I really like, but his fans are kinda crazy. Wish it couldn't be that way. Wish it wasn't so. Review the SpongeBob movie game, the answer's always no. I love you, SpongeBob. You ready? Of course you're ready. You're SpongeBob. There's a video about SpongeBob. <laughs> of course you'd be ready. Freaking loser. Shitty ass SpongeBob. You're not even a magic eraser. You're just a regular sponge. You don't even have the scrubby shit on the back. What kind of sponge are you? Freaking SpongeBob. It's gonna be all the blues. <laughs>